Hello everyone, welcome to Your World or Mine. Show me yours and I'll show you mine. Today we have beautiful Ruve Astrid here, all the way from Norway. Oslo, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Well, mm -hmm. I'm actually, currently I'm not in Oslo. I'm mm -hmm. in the southern part of the country, which is um, to many of holiday paradise. So today I'm located further south than Oslo. Yeah. That's very interesting. You know, for me as an alien, where I come from, it seems like you have this break thing, like a summer break. Tell, yeah. me, more, tell me more about that. What is that like? <laughs> well, basically, I guess this is something that came up when workers realized, well, the, the, the bosses realized that their workers needed a, a vacation, a holiday, a break from the everyday uh, life. And uh, I, I'm not sure how it is all around the world, but in Norway, we have a holiday, a summer holiday, a break for all the kids at school, actually, which lasts like two months, eight weeks. What are the parents going to do? How can they actually, you know, follow up their kids during eight weeks? Because the parents are still working. Because we have maybe three to five weeks of holiday or summer break. Uh, but in my family, we have four weeks together. So we just finished our first week. And all Norwegian people love to work on their tan in summertime. Oh. <laughs> A lot of us do so uh, we're really happy when the sun is shining which it is doing now and uh, the weather is really really warm it's around 27 to 30 degrees and it's been like that for it feels like ages it's like I think it's around six weeks uh, the last time we saw the rain so the farmers aren't that happy but of course everyone on a holiday are so yeah <laughs> that's fascinating you, you know I actually mentioned two things that really excites me Okay. And I'm really curious about it. First, you speak about the tan. What's a tan? <laughs> well, this, this is relatively strange uh, for an alien, I can imagine. Because maybe mm. you've seen around the world, there are people with different skin colors. And mm. where I come from, far north, we're relatively pale, nearly white mm. in our skin. But in summertime, the sun is shining more than we used to. And the part of the world where I live, we are not that far away from what we call the midnight sun. The sun never sets mm -hmm. for maybe two months above the polar circle, which is you can't see the circle, but it's there geographically. And above this circle, the sun shines 24 seven during two, two months. And we, the people of the north, uh, as I said, we're usually quite pale, but in summertime, we really profit from the little sun that we get to develop another skin color. So we're trying to get a brownish color. The thing is, a lot of us get rather pink and red because the sun mm -hmm. is, is really, really warm and really hot. So it's burning us and we have to put on some cream in order not to, to get too burnt. Uh, and we're you know, when, when the summer break is over and we're going back to school and to work and to everyday life, the tan fades, but we still keep the memory of it. So, yeah, it, it might sound a bit strange. And quite often you will see people lying on beaches, you know, where the, where the water is, trying to sunbathe, trying to get as much tan as possible. Yeah, no, that's is, how it is. Is that good for your skin, though? Not really. Mm. No, it's not. Well, the thing is, the sun is full of vitamin D. Or mm -hmm. not the sun, but the light from the sun. And we need the vitamin D. And here in the north, um, as I told you, we have the midnight sun in summertime. But far north, we, we don't see the sun at all in wintertime. So we don't get the, the, the vitamin D mm -hmm. that we need. So we get it from fish instead, from fish oil and so on. But we're trying to stack up as much as we can. In mm. that sense, the sun is good for us, but burning our skin is not good. So that's why we have sunscreen, which is a, a cream or a lotion that we put on our body so we can stay out in the sun longer. But we should be really, really careful. And I know that, I'm, I'm not sure how it is in South Africa or in Australia, but I know that in Australia, it has been a huge problem with people getting cancer, getting sick from mm. the sun. 
But if you're cautious, I mean, everything, it's about, mm -hmm. you know, the, the golden middle way. Mm -hmm. So if you're cautious, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be that big a problem. But I, I guess I'm, I'm probably spending too much time in the sun. So I can see sometimes I, I keep saying that I'm like a tricolor, um, tricolored uh, person because I have white skin in some parts of the body, then I have pink and brown. So mm -hmm. it looks like chocolate, strawberry and vanilla. <laughs> You know, you mentioned something that interests me as well. There's so many things that you just shared that I must now remember to ask you about. But the first thing is, we I hear that humans, the younger people, the ones who, who came more recently, that they yeah. spend a lot of time indoors, across the world, in your world. So they don't get this vitamin D thing you're speaking about much of. Well, it depends on what they're doing and why they are indoors. Mm -hmm. uh, during summer break, they don't need to be that much indoors because, you know, for the rest of the year, they spend a lot of time in school or even if they're younger, in kindergarten while their parents are working. And in school, they're learning a lot of things. So that's really important. But in summer break, and especially if the parents have the same time, their summer mm -hmm. break, you know, parents can spend more time outdoors with their kids and they should because instead a lot of kids today are staying indoors playing on computers, on iPads, mm -hmm. mobile phones, etc., watching television, which in some senses it could be good because you're probably learning things from that as well. But I think, again, you know, looking for the balance and the golden middle way, we should probably try to get them more outdoors and play, use their body, use their physique, um, build muscles, be strong, mm -hmm. uh, have fun, play with, with others. Um, now at the moment we're staying with my parents-in-law and they're looking after a dog and this dog needs to be walked uh, for, for several times a day. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. my son is walking him around, which is great fun. And you know, they get around, they see things, they meet other dogs, etc. So yeah. Um, but I, I, do, I do see what you're talking about. Kids do spend too much time indoors these days. So, mm. so yeah. You, yeah, you mentioned the parents thing as well, that if the parents can be with them, obviously then they can go out together and they can do activities together or just holidaying, like you say, vacationing together. Yeah. Which is very interesting, yeah. for, which is very interesting for us as well, because where I come from, we don't have this thing called a holiday or a vacation. Don't you ever have breaks? You see, we have a very different lifestyle. For okay. us, for us, what works for us, and we're not saying it should work for you too, because I mean, we're from a different planet. But from our perspective, we try to balance our daily lives. So I think we live more in the moment to make mm -hmm. time to relax during each day. As, as you say, the sun comes up and the sun goes down. Yeah. That time period to have a more balanced life in the moment. Because we heard that on earth, a lot of people have lots of stress, related diseases and things like that. Yep. You see, in our world, it hardly ever happens because we're learning, we're still learning as well, we haven't perfected it at all, is to spread our lives across the day. So to have some time to play, some time to relax, some time so to, do, to do things together with others. So we just, it's just simply the way you would maybe use the word schedule, the way we schedule our lives. Yeah. We at least leave one or two hours a day for things we, for surprises, for something that we haven't planned. Uh -huh. And then during that time, and also depending on the weather like you have as well, what, it is in, what the environment is like outside. Can we go outside and do something? Can we do something fun? or something relaxing inside, wherever we are, and, we, and with whoever we are. So in that way, we actually feel and we realize that we can actually be more productive. That when once we do something, we're a lot more energized, we have a lot more vitality, there's enthusiasm because we feel energized. <laughs> and we've learned that even just a five minute break, somewhere, in different time slots, can give us that vitality and that energy just to go forward again, just to say pause. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, it's important to have breaks and pauses during the day. And I, I guess you're right. Um, 
our earth citizens are not that good at you know living in the moment some people are mm -hmm. but i guess the majority isn't so it's and the stress factor is well known uh, especially in you know what we call the industrialized world or part of the world um but at the same time you know during a day during a normal day we would have breaks you know we don't mm -hmm. necessarily get up <laughs> when when the dawn breaks we get up a little bit later than that because now the sun is rising at 3 30 in the morning wow. here where i am that's mm -hmm. pretty early, that's so pretty I, early I, don't, yeah. I don't really feel like getting up then uh, but in a normal day, I would be getting up at around seven. Then I would have breakfast with my family before we start working and going to school. Uh, and of course, you have breaks during the day um, for eating, just for going out, maybe to make a phone call to someone you're related to, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then in the afternoon, because we don't work that many hours every day either, necessarily. Sometimes, well. I'm, you know, I'm just working by myself. So sometimes I'm working six hours a day, other times 10 to 11 hours. That depends on, you know, the mm -hmm. deadlines that I have. But um, once my son gets home from school, we usually gather together for a meal. So we have dinner together, either him and me or my husband and him, because we can't always mm -hmm. sort of make that happen for all three of us at the same time and we usually have activities in the afternoon or evening that could be football it could be skiing i don't know if you're familiar with skiing i heard about it yeah. you've heard you, about you, it yeah, you slide on the ice or the snow yeah the, snow. the snow the snow yeah mm -hmm. yeah you need mm -hmm. snow to do skiing mm -hmm. so it's either uh downhill which goes really fast or it could be uh cross country which is you know it's more flat so you uh, but you have different kinds of skis for different kinds of skiing and activities so um and then when the sun sets uh in winter time it sets maybe even at five o'clock so we don't go to bed when the sun sets then and we don't go to bed when the sun sets now either because now it sets at half past 10 in the mm -hmm. evening so we have a lot of daylight now in summertime. So that's why we, you know, we have to profit from it. But anyway, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking a little bit about everything now. Uh, no, but that's good for us. That's good. We <laughs> want to hear those things. <laughs> yeah, but in the usual week then, um, we would probably, you know, spend some time in front of the telly to start with to get the news because we would like to know what's happening around the world in our own country mm -hmm. uh, and our neighborhood. And then, you know, it's time for bed. So around 10, 11, mid, sometimes midnight, it all depends. So of course we do have breaks during the day, but I do, I definitely agree. We do have a quite high level of stress when we are in our everyday life. So summertime is all about sort of relaxing and just logging off because we're too much online these days. So I've been, offline now for several days which is really great so i keep you know it's like uh, what is it is it sunday today or is it saturday or is it maybe monday well i don't know and i don't care uh so i'm getting really this off situation and of course yeah we should have that more during our everyday lives but sometimes it's difficult to do that but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really interested in hearing how you do it in your world because you said the sun rises and the sun sets when the sun sets what do you do then i mean do you go to bed and do you sleep all the way until the sun rises again or how how does that work no no we have still lots of activities <laughs> we have a very 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 strong dream world okay and Tell in me our about it. in our in our dream world we actually create a lot of things so it's not a passive thing from my understanding from what we hear from people on earth so a lot of people don't even think they dream when well, they can't remember their dreams. No, that's true. But, but for us, the dream world is a very active part of our lives. Our experience of what happens when we wake up. So in that dream world already, we start to create for the next day or for what's coming. Okay. But can you control that? Can you control what oh, happens yes. in the dream world? Oh, okay. yes. Oh, yes. And you, you wow. start realizing 
but they are different dreams. There's dreams that we process things that happens during the day or have, but that has happened in the past that you would refer to as the past. Yeah. And then there's dreams where you can actively, by with your intention before you go to sleep, decide what you want to create in the dream. Wow. So for instance, you have an aspiration or an intention. And there's this little process that we use, that before you go to bed, you use do the little process. And then in your dream world, you start creating that. And through practice, like, you know, like you said, you're building your, you strengthen your body, you stimulating muscles. It's the same thing. You stimulate your dream muscle. Right. And the stronger that dream muscle become, you and you have the intention to remember it when you wake up as well, that what you have created, because sometimes you have a specific intention to have a dream, and to do something in that dream to create something. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to meet something, somebody. Maybe you want to experience a specific experience. You can then mm -hmm. create it in your dream world. And when you wake up, you write it down. So for us, you bring it into your experience while you're awake. So it's some kind of preparation, it sounds like. Yeah, we just, it, it's, very, it's a very simple process before you go to bed. Yeah. For, for example, we drink what you call water. Yeah. And then there's a little process of setting the intention. Your mind is also here. <laughs> we also love water. It's very good for us as well. <laughs> and it's a really, it's not even a two-minute process before you go to bed. Just setting that intention and what you want to create. Yeah. And that you want to remember it. So you're instructing your subconscious mind to remember it when you wake up. Mm. And then there's a little process that we follow while we're in the dream world. We would, for example, now in your case, would be very interesting because of your day and night changes, especially of your seasons. Where we yes. come from, it's a lot more similar day and night. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's not that these extremes that you're talking about, the two hour, 24 hour day, for example, it, because yeah. our bodies, our vehicles, who we are, respond to the day and the night. Yeah. The light and when there's no, when it's dark. So that will make it interesting to see what happens with you when you follow the process. <laughs> because you see, we are so tuned with our body and mind. They are working together. And it's really a strong connection, this body-mind mm. connection of ours. Mm. Mm. So it will be interesting to see what happens with yours because our bodies helps in the process. Yeah. So we would, for instance, when we start, we would put on the alarm for two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And then we'll drink some water when we wake up and go back straight to sleep. And that simple thing of drinking water in that moment takes you into a deeper level of sleep. Really? And it's in that deeper level of sleep that you actually create. Aha. Uh -huh. That you manifest what you bring, what you bring in. Yeah. But it's really a simple process. I will share it easily with you. It's a wonderful process. Because yeah. it makes our lives much more easier. And I wouldn't like to use the word control because we don't like that word where we come from. No, okay. But you have more, you have more control over it of what you want to happen in your life. So you're more in charge. I'd rather say you're more in charge of what ha yeah. what's happening in your life. Yeah. That, that's, that's why I said, to me, it sounds like you're kind of using your dream life to be better prepared for, or even not necessarily better prepared, but you're actually, it's, it's like if you're standing in front of a mirror and uh, you keep, keep saying to yourself, oh my God, you're so stupid. In the end, you do believe that you are mm -hmm. stupid, but at the same time, if you do it, reversely mm. if you're saying good morning sunshine you look great today if you say that every morning for 30 days in the end you're starting to believing it and i'm thinking that what you're describing as your process in the dream world or dream life um to me it sounds like a way of being more conscious mm -hmm. about your subconsciousness and at the same time trying to yeah maybe be in charge or, or even control how you're going to deal with things that happen mm -hmm. not necessarily what is actually going to happen or what you create but you're 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 actually 
putting it into a level of consciousness, which is much more, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's easier to, to, to see it if you don't do it. And I think that a lot of people, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm like a lot of people that you've talked to mm -hmm. saying that I don't remember what I dreamt last night. Uh, and very often I, I keep thinking I didn't dream anything at all. And I have a son who has a lot of vivid dreams. So he's actually playing them out as he's mm -hmm. asleep. So he can shout and he can walk around and he mm -hmm. sees things that aren't there, at least not for us, um, which is, I'm not going to say it's strange, but sometimes it's rather scary because he shouts so, so loudly. Uh, but I, at, at the same time, when we ask him the next morning, did you, do you really realize that you were dreaming last night or what did you dream last night? And he's like, what? I didn't dream anything. Uh, yeah, you did. No, I didn't. So that's his response every time. So I guess it's difficult to, to sort of reach that level of consciousness when it comes to what happens when we have our eyes closed and are sleeping. Uh, but it would be interesting to try, of course. <laughs> but especially how you see what you mentioned about your son. It's, yeah. fascinating, it's fascinating to us because when we play with our children, our younger ones, yeah. We don't call it education. We have a different word for it. We call it sense making. Sense making, yeah. Yeah, sense making. It's, it's not making sense because making sense is the verb, the making part is before the sensing part. Yeah. So you, the doing part is before you becoming conscious and aware of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Yeah. Where, whereas with sense making, you first sense into what's happening and then you, from that information, then you also tap into the collective intelligence. And from there, you, you then create. So it's, yeah. a, it's an informed creation. So it's not creating, acting and then looking at what, what did I do. But your son interests me because the fact that he can't remember it is okay. Because he's consciously dreaming. Hmm. And he can, if he learns how to use that, it can be very powerful for him. Especially when he, in his learning processes as well. Yeah. So it's very interesting. And, and I think from our perspective, it, what comes to me now is when I sense into what you just shared, because that's how we operate. I sense into what you just shared about your son, is that his potential is enormous because his level of consciousness is higher than the ones who came before, because mm -hmm. he came into a different level of consciousness. Because things have evolved, things have changed. Things don't like, think our understanding on earth don't stay the same. Mm. Continuously evolve. You have more and more things becoming revealed. All the technology advances, the communication advances, the way that we can actually now connect like this in this moment and share in this way. And yeah. explore and explore in this way. Yeah. So that's for us, the younger generations make us very exciting because they have different perceptive ways of perception. And that's what we are all about as well, to share different ways, new ways of perceiving. Mm. And then you also mentioned how we will respond. So it's preparing us on how we're going to respond to what happens to us. Yeah. Where before we're complete sort of victim because of what's coming to us, we have no say in it. But in this way, it's just one simple way of how we can actually be more responsive to what's yeah. happening around us. So that we don't go into depression necessarily and things like that. Mm. But I want to come back to your tanning thing. <laughs> because your tanning, okay. your tanning thing raised something very interesting. A little birdie told me that there's a specific area that you got quite interested in apparently. <clears throat> and that tanning thing comes to that. Now you can tell me if I'm correct, but we've heard that on Earth, there's the ozone layer. Yeah. <clears throat> and because of the way humans currently live, they just consume, consume, they like, we would call, it's called, cap, in our sense, we'd say it's capitalist behavior, just taking more, consuming more, eating more, um, and want to know more. So we do it with everything, humans do it with everything, information, uh, the resources of the earth, everything. 
which cause the ozone layer, because they're not living consciously, using that word again, um, for something called climate change. Now, what can you tell me about that? Oh, we can talk about that for hours and days and still haven't finished uh, it all. Um, right, so um, the ozone layer is, is a part of this huge picture. Uh, and the good thing is that the, well, the, the ozone layer is one layer in the atmosphere protecting the Earth from the dangers of the sun, for instance. So the sun is the source, the sun and water are the sources of all life on Earth. The problem is, as you were saying, we humans, we are actively destroying our world, as I see it. Um, and if you look at, because scientists have done this wonderful research for many, many years, and they have these long series where they can measure the temperature on the globe. They can measure the amount of CO2, which is a greenhouse gas. So all this is relatively complicated, but the easy thing is that we're heating up our, temp our, uh, our, our, our earth, uh, our, um, yeah, our planet so much that we are killing different species of animals, we are killing different kinds of plants, we are making our world unlivable, which is really, really bad. Uh, but the thing is, there's a really wise man called Barack Obama, who was the president of the United States of America, and he said, we are the first generation who are really aware of uh, the consequences of climate change and also the ones who can do something about it. We're actually also the last generation who can't do anything about it. You know, like we, we really have to do these changes. I'm probably not citing him correctly now, but the, his message is that we have to act now. We should have started acting yesterday. And there have been scientists, politicians and others talking about this for generations actually because uh, we see that the temperature on on earth is so rapidly rising so if you look at my hand this could be the the, the temperature rise for centuries or even thousands of years like this and then the last 150 years it's you know it's it's just peaking and that has probably to do with the industrial revolution which was around 1850 where we started using machines and these machines were running on coal for instance and coal is it's not really sustainable it's it isn't sustainable it's not a it's not a resource that we should be using it's a fossil reserve first of all, together with oil and gas. So these fossil reserves, resources and reserves, they are a huge part of how we're destroying our world. So our consumption as well is really bad because, you know, like if I buy uh, a dress, I can use it and then I can think, yeah, well, I don't want it anymore. So I just get rid of it. If I throw it away, I'm throwing away, you know, um, the people who worked on it, the people who shipped it, because it was probably made in China, which is on the other side of the, the earth. Then uh, also the people transporting it to my country, the people who were working in the shop where I bought it. And all these people together, all these systems together, are creating this huge consumption spiral, so to speak, or a cycle. But the problem is that if we keep just using and using and not reusing and recycling, but just throwing things away, we're just making this huge garbage, uh, pile of garbage somewhere. And what is happening then? I mean, uh, if we can't recycle and reuse things, things will go terribly wrong. So. Uh, we have to, because you didn't mention sustainability when you were talking, you were talking about consciousness. Uh, and I think these two things are pretty closely linked. So um, in order to, because huge, I'm just rubbling now, I feel. So I'm, I'll try to be more 
analytic about it. But the thing is, when the, the global temperature is rising, the nature is uh, suffering from it and we're suffering with it. So, for instance, I was mentioning how hot it is here now. That is a huge problem in other parts of the world, like Australia, they have bushfires and the bushfires, they kill everything around them. We have forest fires in Norway, we have forest fires in California and in the United States, drought in Africa where cattle die because there's no rain, it's not raining. Mm -hmm. And in other parts of the world, there's raining too much. Um, currently, there's a situation in Thailand where we have a football team of 12 young players and their coach who went into this, um, how do you call it, a grotto, um, mm -hmm. you know, into the, into the mountain. Uh, and then there was a lot of rain causing them to be trapped inside this grotto. And now everyone's fighting to get them out. But the, 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 that's, that, I mean, hopefully, I'm crossing my fingers, they will all be mm -hmm. safe in by tomorrow hopefully the thing is the weather is also part of this so we keep saying that the weather is going to be warmer in parts where we have a lot of warmth already it's going to be wetter where we already have a lot of rain and it's going to be wilder so the hurricanes are not necessarily going to be multiplied in numbers but they're going to be stronger and more devastating and destroying more storms are going to destroy more there's going to be floods that there are going to be avalanches and, and all these kinds this is mother nature telling us please stop destroying me but the problem is people it's too big for them i think it's too it's such a large problem that the the individuals are thinking but i can't i can't do anything about it me myself there's nothing i can do so I'll just hope that the politicians can do it. The politicians are humans as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, they have to make some good decisions about what to do. So in, in 2013, I think, it, no, it was 2015, uh, we had an agreement between nearly all the countries of the world, the Paris Agreement, mm -hmm. where the political leaders of the world are saying we will not let uh, the temperature the temperature go higher than two degrees compared to 1990 level uh, <clears throat> and hopefully we can stop it at 1.5 but already at 1.5 a lot of things are happening in the world that we can't uh, undo There's, th mm -hmm. there are things that can't be changed so the climate is changing as we speak because everyone seems to have been thinking, yeah, but the climate change is coming. No, it's actually happening right now. So we have to do something about that. So consumption is one part of it. And that's something that everyone, every individual, individual can be responsible for their own uh, consumption. And we can, uh, we can recycle, we can, we can travel sustainably. That means we can uh, fly less, we can go more by train and make sure it's an electrical train, of course. Uh, we can cycle, we can be content with visiting our own neighborhood. Uh, we don't have to go that far. We can go by sailboat, which is not, you know, um, harming our environment that much. But then we have another problem, which is plastic. Um, plastic is originally a petroleum product, so it was made after they discovered oil and plastic is a wonderful material i'm looking around to see if i have anything plastic around me well i have this computer where there are several elements of plastic and it lasts forever so to speak and that's the problem because when when we throw our diapers in the bin for instance or even our contact lenses in the toilet <clears throat> it creates eventually tiny tiny fragments of plastic that um the uh, lower levels of the ecosystems in the oceans are eating. So let's say you have this tiny, tiny algae, which is eating plastic. And it, it feels content because, you know, it, its stomach is full. 
The problem is there's no nutrition in plastic. Mm -hmm. So it's slowly dying. It's slowly starving to death. And when you have this level in the ecosystem disappearing, what happens with the next mm -hmm. levels? And we're on the height of these levels in any, in any kind of ecosystem that you're looking, humans are on top of the ecosystems. So that is how we're slowly killing our own grounds for life, so to speak, unless we take action. And I do think that there's cause for optimism because we have, you mentioned, we have, you know, a new world where technology is helping us. So you and I can talk now. We're actually online together mm -hmm. now as we speak, but we're on each side of the world, so to speak. But we can still communicate. I don't have to get on the plane and go, go to see you. Of course, that would be very nice to do that. But sometimes we have to realize that we can't have all these interactions physically. Sometimes we have to settle for sometimes the next best. But in, in many aspects, this is also a very nice way to communicate. So I think that and in my line of work, I am, I'm... Um, meeting a lot of people i'm meeting scientists i'm meeting business people industrial leaders and so on they are truly believing that they can contribute to finding different kinds of solutions to the plastic problem to the consumption problem um making a full circle of life um we're talking about um how you can work the circular economy for instance mm -hmm. where things like the dress that I was talking about. Well, once I've used it and I don't want to use it any longer, I can give it to someone who can maybe alter it and make another garment of it, maybe a skirt, which could fit someone else. And this person could use the skirt until she realizes, no, actually, now it's going to be part of a rug that I need. And then you're going to use it and reuse it and reuse it. And eventually... The tiny fragments that are left of this dress could be used or could be put away um, in uh, a safe place where it doesn't harm anyone. Uh, so I do believe that we can solve these issues if we're working together. And if everyone actually stops to realize that we can play a role, each and every one of us. In Norway, for instance, um, we've I shouldn't say famous, but we, we have a lot of electric cars in my country. Mm -hmm. Well, when I say we have a lot of them, it means around 5% of all the cars mm -hmm. that we have in Norway are electric. So it isn't that much, but it's half of all the new cars that were sold this year were electric. So that is mm -hmm. quite a substantial number. So that's a good thing. So electric cars, they don't harm the environment in the same manner mm -hmm. that fossil driven cars do but they still take a lot of space i mean we want our space in our cities to be for pedestrians for people walking mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. meeting communicating etc you can't really communicate if there's one person in each car driving around because you have you know you have the walls of the car uh making that difficult and everyone in a car wants to get from a to to b as fast as possible. So there's another way of communicating. So <clears throat> I believe that the change that we're seeing in a lot of large cities around the world now, trying to push the car away, even though it's fossil driven mm -hmm. or electrical, that is a good thing. And they're saying, yeah, let's bring the cities back to people. Because 80% of all humans are living in a city or close to a city today. That's a huge amount of people. Mm -hmm. So I believe that interacting between us and meeting people with other perspectives, of course, we don't have to agree about everything, but we can, I am hoping that at least the majority of people will realize that we have a problem. We have a problem with climate change. We have a problem. I didn't even mention the ozone layer. And that's because the problem of the ozone layer is nearly solved. I'm saying nearly, because there were holes in the ozone layer above the poles, especially the North Pole, I think it was, or around it. 
And the, the, the interesting thing is politics played a huge and important role in solving that problem. Um, they realized that, um, I don't know if, if you've ever used a deodorant mm -hmm. spraying, yeah? So these sprays, there, there are all kinds of sprays, but the, the majority of the sprays were made with aerosols and gas, gases. And these gases were destroying the ozone layer. So they put a ban on it. They said, no more of these uh, sprays and mm -hmm. products with these aerosol gases. It's over, it's finished. And this was part of a political process. So everyone agreed to do that. Producers stopped making them. And boom, the ozone layer was fixed. So that gives me hope mm -hmm. to see that, yeah, we can solve a problem. Of course, then there will probably be another problem popping up. But we can solve those as well. We have uh, pollutants that are really harmful. I mean, I was mentioning plastic. Plastic in itself is mm -hmm. not... Is not a pollutant, but it's, it's a mechanical thing, making a lot of problems. But you could have chemicals within the plastic that could be uh, harmful as well. So we have to deal with that. So, of course, there are, there are lots of issues that we should be solving and there are huge challenges to us. But I have met so many interesting people and so many knowledgeable people. They are so wise and creative and I know that they will be able to once they put their heads together to to make a lot of good solutions and what what I'm trying to do is to ask questions to mm -hmm. make people potentially see new perspectives and to come together I'm not sure if I I alone can't do that of course I know that but hopefully I can contribute to some some questions being asked at least Thank you for that. You know, it's fascinating and I just want to tell you from our perspective, you are definitely making a difference because you're making people aware of things by asking these questions. Mm. And in our understanding is when something happens, you can tell people about many things. It doesn't have the, going to have any influence on them necessarily. Mm. If you just tell them. Don't yeah. you, so, so if you say don't use these cans of these aerosols, for example, or uh, don't use gas and oil or whatever it might use public transport. Um, so you're giving them directives, so you're telling them about stuff, but it has no meaning to them no. because they the, the level of to get to be at the level of awareness where you realize everything is interconnected. So whatever I'm doing is influencing everybody around me mm. and my own life. And we don't like to speak about the future. We prefer to speak about the present moment. Mm. What am I doing here? Because yeah. we believe that when we speak about the future, it creates fear. Whereas in the moment, I can be responsible for what I'm doing now and accountable, which is also words we don't really like to use. But mm. it's necessary when you speak about these things. Mm. But for us to have that understanding that everything is interconnected, it's we come out of a world from our understanding where humans have lived in like silos. Mm, yeah. And that's why some of the problems are arising in the world at the current yeah. moment. Yeah. But technology and communication, like you say, things like that makes it possible for people to become more and more aware of what's really happening. That we don't have to wait till everything is died out and there's not enough food for us for everybody and enough clean water for everyone and things like that now in africa for example from our understanding is there's a lot of people who don't have even access to us, some of those things that you're speaking about no. and they and they're still living so they're living without these things in some remote parts they're living without these things and they can also prosper and thrive just in a very different way so it's again yeah. a different perspective on life. Yeah. But so you have to say what to tell the young people, the people who came more recently, what is it that they can do um, if you take the current circumstances in the world and the things that you've just spoken about? Mm -hmm. What if you have to say to them, 
something that they can take with them, what would that be in terms of living more consciously and being more aware of everything that they do because of how it affects the rest of their lives, their future? What would it be? That's a huge question. <laughs> it is. Um... Because you are seeing, and uh, you, you seem to, from what you just shared with me, it's very knowledgeable. And like you say, you speaking to very interesting people. You're asking them these questions. So if you take that bigger picture, and I'm like 14 years old, what would you tell me? I think I would try to impose hope in a 14 year old human being or alien or whatever, um, saying that we need to be conscious about where we are. I mean, we can't really put that under a rug as we say here in Norway, because uh, it's there. The thing is, we do have a challenge. But I think that once you are aware of the challenge, it is easier to find a solution. And to find a solution, you need hope. You need to believe that this is going to be possible to, to do. Uh, we can make that change together. And I think I would encourage the young people to search knowledge. Because you were mentioning, you know, how the technology is making for a lot of the people living on earth today, it's, it's actually making the world smaller because we can find out anything mm -hmm. within five minutes, seconds uh, of just tapping some buttons on a phone or a computer or a tablet or whatever. But the problem is in this easily accessed world of information, there's so much information that it's difficult to find out what is the right information for me to believe in or to follow or to, to think of as factual information. Because we have currently a political leader talking about fake news, saying that we have news around us that's not true. And of course, there will always be people trying to advocate for their own point of view maybe they have some certain interests in doing that. Mm -hmm. So my, my advice would be to search knowledge um, and find it in the scientific way. Because I think, and I do believe that scientists are providing us with important knowledge and um, vital information. So that would be a starting point. And then I would, the next thing I would do was to encourage people to challenge themselves by meeting others that aren't necessarily as they are themselves. So meet other people, meet different people, um, ask them questions. I've been a journalist for many, many years, and I've never been used to sort of displaying my own points of view. Uh, or my own opinions. And I'm still not very much used to doing that. But of course, I do have my own opinions mm -hmm. and my, my own points of view. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I've been used to asking questions in order to find out what is the point of view of this person in front of me. But using that, being curious, and I know children, you know, the, the, the youngest of the young people, they have this wonderful curiosity and their capacity to ask questions is truly fascinating. And they see things from different angles, um, quite often that I never even thought of, and they are playful. So mm -hmm. remain playful, keep that playfulness within. And combining these three things, being playful, being curious, and searching facts, I think that is a good combination for anyone wanting to make a real change. And, you know, at risk of being um, 
terribly daft or uh, populistic. I, I, you know, I really like to, to go to films, to music and to books, to literature, to have different perspectives. And someone said, if you want to make a change, take a look at the man in the mirror, which is really true. You have to stop with yourself and you have to believe in it. And then slowly things will evolve and, and change. And that's why I'm optimistic as well, as I told you earlier, because I see things are changing. We are not, we're not living as they were living in London at the, the end of the last century, where people, you know, smog was a, a huge problem. It is a huge problem in China nowadays, but in China, I think that's really, I hope that you're talking to someone from China, because that's such a contrast filled country. You know, they're, they're opening new coal mining factories almost every week. And at the same time, they're building windmills and, and, you know, doing all these wonderful things for renewable energy resources. So they're, they're, so, they're doing one thing with one hand, a completely opposite thing with the other hand. So, yeah, that would be really interesting. But once again, I'm just going off the track again but no 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 it's <laughs> wonderful <laughs> back to to yeah i think that's actually my conclusion so stay playful curious creative and fact-based because i do believe that um because it's so easy you were talking about silos and we're also talking about echo chambers which we have in a technological world mm -hmm. that you today things are being matched and mixed to um, to sort of suit you and your personal uh, preferences, and I think that's a really bad thing because then you keep just repeating yourself and being reassured about whatever you're thinking, and that's that's not a way to change people. That's a way just to cement them and to keep them where they are. So yeah, continue to ask questions. That's probably the the main conclusion. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. wonderful. Now for us, from our perspective, we, we don't even use the word change much. We, oh, use, okay. we use the word grow. Because from our understanding with humans, it's very similar. The baby just knows how to grow within the mother's womb. Mm. It's a natural process. When the baby starts to crawl and to walk, it's a natural process. It's an instinct, something that happens from within. So growth is not a strange thing to humans and to us as well. So it's continuously expanding and growing. And we call it also your for, your frame of reference. So what are you for? Is to expand that all the time. Change, just move it to this side a little bit and then you'll see the same thing from a different angle. Yeah. It's like me holding this object. Oh, you see that side, I see this side. But if I move it, I see a very different picture. But it's the same yeah. item. It and that's, is. And that's, the, that's what it's about. And to they know that chain of where did this come from? Who actually worked on making this happen and bringing it into being? That I can now use it. So it's that whole process. So you mentioned something wonderful there about the people who, you know, who created the, the dress. And, yeah. uh, and we take it even further from where the cotton was on the field. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the farmer growing the cotton. So it's that long chain, that understanding. Yeah. So that's absolutely wonderful. And it's for us extremely delightful to hear somebody so knowledgeable speaking about something like climate change, for example, mm. and to hear the, your perspective on that. And that it's very important for the ones who came more recently to also understand the consequences of our daily lives, of how we do things, how we look at life, how we look yeah. at each other, and like you say, starting with ourselves. Mm. Um, so from that's, that's extremely, extremely useful, I think, for my people as well to hear, because everything is connected, whether we're on a different planet or not, we're part of the same universe. Yes. So everything affects everybody, and, we, and everything I think and do uh, have an effect on everything else. And the important part for me as well is that you mentioned is there's hope. And we have all these amazing geniuses within ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> We're just waiting to be fanned into action. 
yeah. to come, come up with the solutions that the world um, needs at this moment in time. Yeah. So we're extremely grateful for that. And we there's one thing that we haven't talked about and when you were talking about how you're not using the word change but growth instead <clears throat> which actually put me on back onto that track because in human language growth is very often linked to economy so um and that is also part of this consumption mm. being uh, not cyclic or circular but actually just peaking straight up because everyone wants growth and that is a quite well that's actually a statement that i'm trying to challenge different people with asking them why do we need this growth why is growth important and usually the the response that i'm getting from all kinds of people well-educated people, well-informed people, is that we need growth in order to maintain uh, the welfare that we have in our society, you know, making sure that if you get ill, you will find a doctor in a hospital who is capable of helping you and it's not going to cost you very much mm -hmm. at all. So the welfare system, I don't think we have time to get into that, but the welfare system in the Nordic countries is is a very renowned welfare system. So in short, um, everyone who's worked and paid their taxes are contributing to a system where people who can't work, people who are maybe too old to work or too young to work, they can get the help that they need. So the school is free, uh, dental health care is free until you're 18 or 23, I'm not sure. Um, and you have, mm -hmm you know, all these kinds of, of goods that, that are helping you, good services that are helping you from the society itself. But growth as a concept is problematic to me when I'm looking at mm. climate change. Because if we keep mm. growing and growing and growing, and we have, you know, I mentioned the industrialized part of the world. Mm -hmm. So we have the so-called developing countries that we haven't even touched upon. Um, a lot of countries in Africa are defined as developing countries. And of course, they want to be part of the same welfare system as well. Of course, why shouldn't they? They would like to be sure that they live in a good house, that they have food on the table, um, a roof over their heads, clothes to, to, to dress in, etc. And why shouldn't they? But we have a lack of energy in huge parts of the world. And energy is actually one of the, the, the cornerstones for any livable society. Mm -hmm. So you need energy in order to build, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we have to deal with the growing problem, the growing problem of <laughs> not <having> growth. <laughs> so no pun intended. Um, but yeah, we, yeah, I think we have to deal with that. But I'm not sure how we're going to do that. So that's a challenge, actually, for for the ones who are newly arrived, to to see how do we deal with that. How can we sort of transform this peaking growth into a circular growth? Because I believe in the circular economy. I think that's a good thing for our ecosystems. And you were saying that babies grow naturally. And I think naturally and nature are two very important mm -hmm. key words here. Because we have to take, I mean, nature is what is giving us all that we need. You mentioned the cotton mm -hmm. on the fields. That's a natural product. We can, we can, we can, we can produce the scent of banana if we want to chemically. But it's not a banana. The banana mm -hmm. has to grow in a banana tree. So we need Mother Earth, we need nature, and we have to take care of her. And in Norway, uh, five, six years ago, someone put together a, an expert group, a panel of experts, who were looking into um, the value of uh, the ecosystems, actually putting a price tag saying that um, the cod swimming in the ocean is worth this much that many billions of dollars uh, for the Norwegian society and for the global society and the crop on the fields is worth this much etc the, the forests they're worth this much and I think I, I, I 
I think that's a good way uh, to meet people who have this economic perspective to things to see that oh so nature isn't something that we can take for granted it actually has a value if we uh, administer it correctly so we have to administrate it uh, I mean so we have to have to administrate it in a, in a good manner mm -hmm. in order to make this value come true so yeah but then again growth is a huge issue that we probably won't have the time to talk too much about tonight <laughs> but um, it could be interesting to do that some other time yeah i think we should because i think from our perspective there's there's a, a few interesting parts to what we refer to as growth yeah but i i completely hear what you say about economic growth the way, and it, it also goes back to language the vocabulary we use yeah. To, to explain and define things and every word has has energy it has a vibration yeah um and how we use it so it's the same thing it's a consumption thing as well so that would be very interesting as well that would be absolutely wonderful to do <laughs> i'm just sensing to all of this in this moment and wow i think for those who's going to have the wondrous opportunity to join us in this way to watch this later and to engage in what has been said i would like to invite them just to take a moment as well from what they are hearing and what they're listening to and just also to feel their bodies what does it feel like uh, when you because we've been used to just auditory hear things it doesn't necessarily really sink in and just take that pause and to just observe how am I affecting what's going on around me? Am I even thinking of these things on a daily basis? Do I even recognize it? Do I even consider it? Would I even go and research it for a little, like you say, go and look at what's out there, who says what about it, and my own, your own experiences. So I'd like to invite everybody who's going to engage in this to just take a moment um to just let it sink in yeah. and to be with it and because for me just being with it while you were speaking about it is my whole body responded to it and my body is very interesting i'm very sensory from where i come from so it's like all my cells they they, they act, they're actually responding to what you're saying so for me that's a sign of there's truth in what you were sharing and that's something that I would personally also like to go and explore more. And I really look forward, Rupa Astrid, to have another session with you on this growth thing because I think that's going to blow the humans' minds <laughs> because there's so many, there's so many aspects to it. And just the words, just using the words and changing the vocabulary by itself is, is changing lives and it's changing how we live and how we respond to life. So thank you very much, Ruth Astrid. Um, and from my understanding, the, the name Ruth is one, she was one hell of a woman's leader at her time. So uh, thank you so much for being a leader in this way and for contributing to your wonderful world and our world and our universe in this magnificent way with what you're doing every day. And on a closer level to your family, your son and your husband, and your loved ones. So thank you very much for that. And everyone, Ruth Astrid has graciously um, agreed that we can share her details with you. I think it, surely in terms of especially what we, what came forth tonight is that you are most welcome to contact Ruth Astrid. The details will be at the end of this video and this podcast. And let's continue this in, this conversation. So thank you very much, everybody. Some last words, Ruth Astrid? Well, I think you summed it up pretty nicely, Hanalee. So uh, I would say thank you to you for bringing these questions up onto the table and letting me just, you know, an ordinary inhabitant in the North to, to express some of my views. So I really want to thank you. And I would uh, just say, Good luck to everyone watching and don't hesitate to contact me and I'll follow up as uh, best as I can. So thank you. That's wonderful. Bye-bye everyone.